Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm your host, Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith with everyday life. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Down to Earth Ministry, a ministry of stewardship, a mission of faith, and by the generous support of our patrons. For more information, please visit downtoearthministry.org. That's down, the number two, earthministry.org. Let's get to it. Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm super pumped today. Joining me on the podcast is a good friend of mine. He's been with us a couple of episodes before, uh, but today we're going to welcome Joe Heschmeyer. And Joe is an expert at something that I've really been running into in my conversations with a lot of people about the Catholic Church. Joe's an expert in the early church in particular. And you you may have read his book, Pope Peter. It's it's a great book to, to learn about the papacy in a, in a down-to-earth way to help people understand things about how we know that Peter was the first pope. And I've had conversations with people who would say things to me like, well, you know, Keith, Catholics aren't Christians. And I would say like, well, no, they're actually the first Christians. And then they'll just laugh hysterically at me like I am the biggest idiot in the world. So when I saw Joe's new book that just came out called The Early Church, was the Catholic Church? I'm like, dude, this is what I need here to talk to Joe. So I got a hold of my buddy Joe. Joe works at Catholic Answers now, and he is the man to talk about this. So I'm going to bring Joe in, and we are going to get down to the bottom of what we know about the early church and its connection to Catholicism. Joe, how are you, my friend? Welcome to Catholic <laughs> Feedback again. I'm doing great. It's so good to be on the show again. Thank you so much for having me on, Keith. My, my pleasure, man. I remember you were here, I don't know, it was about a year ago when we went yeah. down and prayed the rosary in Kansas City, and then we did a couple episodes on the papacy. You know, did the Catholic yeah. Church invent the papacy? And I thought that th- those were fantastic discussions. But now you've got this new book about the early church, which to me is kind of fascinating because when I was a Protestant in ministry, we were fascinated with the early church. I mean, one of the things I've learned is that evangelical Protestants especially have this fascination with the early church and seek to sometimes link up what they're doing with the early church. I remember in particular, like Willow Creek Church in Chicago made a huge deal out of, we want to like make the foundation of our giant mega church in Chicago to be as close to the early church as possible, which now I kind of think that's hilarious. But why do you think people get so fascinated with the early church? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if you know anything about early Christianity, I mean, super early Christianity, you know that there was fierce persecution from the Romans and that there was persecution on the domestic front from other Jews, that the early Christians to become a Christian, they were taking their life into their own hands in many cases, right? So these are people who uh, fervently believed in Jesus Christ, who uh, accepted what he could do to transform their life and were willing to kind of accept the heavy load of, of taking up their cross. In addition, I think the other reason people want to get back to the early church isn't just that they were like these phenomenally devout Christians, but they're also the Christians closest in proximity uh, to the apostles. So if you want to know like, well, there's five different ways people have interpreted this teaching of the apostles. Well, if, if we find out that, well, the earliest listeners all thought it meant A and nobody ever corrected them, well, that's a really good indication that that's what it means. Uh and, and so if you're, you know, I, I can see A, B, C, D, or E. Okay, now I have a clue where I'm not just left on my own. I'm not left to my own devices. And I think it's also just like, you know, imagine if if you saw, leave Christianity aside for a second. If there was like some new form of Islam that came out tomorrow, and it was radically unlike anything Muslims had believed since the 600s. I think it would be fair to say, yeah, that's not really Islam. Like whatever that is, it might use the Quran, it might, but if it like reinterprets it in such an unrecognizable way, that just doesn't look like the same religion. And I think Christians are on some level aware of that. Like if the Christianity you're practicing is unrecognizable as Christianity in the 2000 year span, uh, and it wouldn't have been recognizable in the early days of the church, that feels like a red flag. That just feels like, you know, um, a good reason to say maybe we're getting it wrong. How did they do things back in the day before it seemed like there was as much corruption and, and everything else? You know, what you didn't say is what 
I remember being the reason why everybody was fired up. And I just found that fascinating. You're talking about theology. You're talking Mm -hmm. about proximity to Christ. You know the reason why I think a lot of... uh, um, you know, evangelical churches are so worked up about the early church and get fired up about it is because that's when all these miracles were happening. Ah, uh, yeah. Like they look at the book of Acts and they go, oh, how do we live a faith where yeah. we see these kind of miracles that look like the book of Acts and they see the incredible growth of the early church? And they're, they're wanting to figure out what's the secret sauce here that God was able to do all these incredible miracles in the book of Acts and the church grows by thousands of people. I mean, Peter's one sermon, 3,000 people. And and they look at that and they go, well, we're experiencing this sort of vanilla, lame, worldly Christianity, but they had this whole other thing going on. I guess what we have to do is get back to that, which I don't think any of those are bad reasons in and of themselves, right. but I what's what's interesting is most people never outside of the Catholic Church are ever really thinking about what the early church theology was because I think there's this presupposition that it's the same as whatever they have right now. Yeah, I think on that, maybe a few things. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're probably going to get a little bit of a split between cessationists and continuationists within Protestantism in terms of whether they think the miracles are kind of a one and done sort of thing or whether they view the miracles as as a sign that uh, we've sort of lost faith and that's why we don't have as many miracles today. But I, I also think you're, you're absolutely right in terms of like the growth and everything else. Um, you, you talked about just the kind of assumption that Christians in the early church must believe basically the same thing as like a non-denominational Christian today. I, yeah, there's, there's a sort of unaware uh, denominationalism and non-denominational Christianity, right? Like the idea that you can just be not a denomination uh, is really tied to this idea that, oh, well, we'll just like go back and do things the way they were in the first century, which is which is a pipe dream at best. It's like saying, you know, you know, when I had the most growth in my life, I grew a lot between the ages of 16 and 17. So I'm just going to go put on my high school clothes and just start acting like I'm in high school and just wait for that growth to happen. And it's like, that doesn't work. And that's not what we're called to do. Like we are called to be the same church as the early church, but we're not called to go back to the early church in the sense of like pretending to be uh, infants when we're full grown adults, that the Mm. mustard seed we're told in Matthew 13 grows into the mustard tree. And so you find these people who are leaving the mustard tree because it doesn't look like the mustard seed anymore. But it's like, yeah, of course it doesn't. I mean, if you understand anything about the growth of the church, if it still has 120 guys in an upper room 2,000 years on, it's failed. So it it shouldn't look like the early church in that sense. Like there should be a lot of things that look different because the promise from the beginning was not just you stay, you know, the small pure band, but like go make disciples of all nations, that it was meant to be an international enormous religion not just like a, a select few. Yeah, I think that's huge. I mean, I think about some of those, what I'll call them, presuppositions about what the early church was like. And, you know, I remember, and of course, I'm thinking back to my experiences, and we would we would talk about how the early church met in homes, Yeah, how it was small group based. So, but I never saw anybody like getting rid of their mega churches, except for maybe like Francis Chan. Yeah. But um, there was this idea that it was led by the Holy Spirit in such an intimate way that there really didn't need to be any sort of hierarchy or any kind of teaching authority, but that it was just, they showed up in houses and they ate together and prayed together and God did all this amazing stuff through the power of the Holy Spirit and everything was awesome. So if we just, you know, that's what the early church should be like. And then they look at like, let's say Catholicism today and they go, oh, well, there's all of these disconnects, you know, the, mm-hmm. the the opulence and the organization and all of these things. But I want to ask you, Joe, as we kind of work through this, does it really even matter? Like, why does it matter what the early church was like for, for any Christian? Yeah, so I kind of alluded a little bit to maybe possible answers to that question in a way. That, you know, the thing I said was like, if, if the apostles could be understood in a number of ways, and if Christians have, in fact— you know, misunderstood them and there's different understandings out there. A good way to find out what they meant is to say, well, what did the original audience understand them to mean? 
And did they correct that audience? Did they give some sort of clarification that, no, no, that interpretation is not right? Because if everybody understands you one way and you let them understand you that way, frankly, that's on you as a teacher. You know, if, if I say something in this interview and you say, oh, are you, you know, like denying the divinity of Christ? And I don't answer that. I just kind of like the conversation roll. It's on me if like I've said something so bad it could be like understood in a heretical way and then don't correct the record when it becomes clear that it's capable of this kind of misunderstanding. That is so given that I'm saying like when the early Christians take like the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, when they believe that baptism saves, when they believe in the papacy, when they believe that there's one bishop per church, when they believe all of these things, they're believing them while like the apostles are still alive. And if those yeah. things are wrong and heretically wrong, what are the apostles doing? Like what, you know, in, in the Protestant view, what are the apostles up to is all of these heresies are overtaking the church and they're not, they're not just like not cracking down on the error. It's to the point that all of their students uh, seem convinced that they taught the error. Like that's a really remarkable kind of view of the apostles. So that's the first thing. Like if you want to understand doctrinal interpretation. The second is, you know, the one we alluded to, I think it's totally legitimate to say, hey, this seems to be a very saintly generation. These seem to be very holy people. What did they believe? How were they living? Because like both Catholics and Protestants should agree that there's a certain kind of life that's only possible with grace. And so you can't say this person is a heretic who's rejected Christ and shows all the hallmarks of living a life infused by grace, you know, doing miracles in this case of some of the early church fathers, like St. Gregory, the wonder worker, uh, going to death for the faith in the case of a lot of the fathers. Like when you see that kind of heroic witness, it would be Pelagian to assume they're capable of all of those good deeds apart from grace. And if you're not going to say they do all those good deeds apart from grace, you have to say, yeah, these guys are being led by God in some sense. And, and so you can't hold that their theology is so off base as to like make them not Christians. Uh, so I think those are a couple really good uh, things to look at uh, in terms of kind of going back to the fathers. Now I want to pivot here a little bit because I want to get back to something you said when it comes to like why Protestants uh, like the early church or the idea of the early church. I do think there's a little bit of a difference between maybe like evangelicals and mainline Protestants. And, and I'm speaking very broadly, even, even in this distinction, there is a popular movement really around like the 19th century and onwards of applying basically our Darwinian model to the church within mainline Protestantism. And so the idea was everything in the early church was simple and all the complexity mm. you get is later. And you'll find this even among, I mean, principally among uh, like liberal Protestant scholars. And so it'd be the idea that like, oh, um, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians couldn't really be written by Paul because the theology of the church is too high. And, and so you're applying that. You're not like saying, what does the evidence lead to? You're applying a certain vision that says, oh, well, you know, just like it goes from a single celled organism up to a complex organism. So too, it goes from a really simple like house church, unstructured, no magisterium, no teaching authority. And then all that structure piles on and, and gets added on later as accretions. And that model is projected back onto the church, not something that you see if you, you start from just saying, well, what did they say? What did they believe? And what do we find when we actually look at the church fathers themselves? No, that, that makes sense to me. So let's just jump in yeah. and ask the question, like, how do we know? that the early church was the Catholic church. Because like I said before, I get laughed out of conversations with that sometimes because people are like, are you kidding me? That the, the Roman Catholic church of today looks so like the opposite of the early church. I mean, you've got all these people just flowing in the Holy Spirit and everyone's just sort of loosey-goosey, right? And then the Catholic church is all these hierarchy and structure and rules and authority and all this stuff. I mean, that's not what the early church was like, was it? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I get where people are coming from with it. And I, I think there's a couple ways to sort of respond to that kind of objection. And the first is I really would be like, well, how much do you look like your baby picture? You know, how much do you look like you looked when you were six? Uh, you know, as you grow, there's going to be some changes that happen, not of you becoming not yourself, but certain things, you know, just as you grow and develop. That's, that's expected. And so, it, you know, in defense of the Protestant views, there is more structure now than there was in the early church. And, and of course there was. If you compare like Apple in the days back when it was in like Steve Jobs' garage 
to Apple today. I bet it's got a lot more hierarchy and a lot more like organizational structures because those structures are necessary to control like the flow of information and, uh, you know, efficiency and everything in a very large organization in a way that like a phone call would work in a small organization or like a face-to-face -face meeting in a very small, you know, like, so yeah, things necessarily, you get more middle management as companies expand, you get more middle management, you know, as countries get bigger, uh, you get more bureaucracy. And so it's, it's not surprising for better, for worse or neutral that you're going to find more of that kind of middle structural stuff in the church as it grows. Like it would be uh, ridiculous to imagine that the church could remain unified as one organization and grow into being a billion people plus and not have more of those middle levels. So in response to that, I, I think Protestants are going to say a few things. One is like, well, how do we know it even should be one organization for lack of a better term? And I think you see it in Acts. You've got Paul going from church to church, telling them what to do, appointing people in a top-down kind of way. And, and you have a clear sense of the apostles, including Paul, have the kind of authority to go anywhere in the world where the church is and kind of run the show and, and set things up organizationally. And then, you know, if it's, you want to stick around for a while, like in Antioch with St. Peter and, and in Rome, or if you want to just like set them up and then go like Paul tends to do, that either way, there's very much a clear sense that there isn't like, you know, the First Baptist Church of Antioch, that's like a separate thing from like the First Methodist Church of Ephesus. Like these aren't, it's one denomination, it's one church, it's one organization, one society, one institution, however you want to describe that. It's clearly one thing. And, and we find those kind of admonitions to be of one heart and one mind, you know, all of that stuff about church unity. So I think for all of those reasons, we got to keep track of a few things. Number one, the church has always meant to be one. Jesus's prayer at the Last Supper in John 17, that we would all be one. And that's not just for the apostles. He's explicitly praying for future Christians. And then second, uh, the idea that we're to go and make disciples of all nations. So we should be one international uh, body of Christ. That's probably going to mean a lot more like immediate structures uh, that kind of help organize things if, if done well in the best of cases, like leave aside like corruption and scandal. You just kind of can't get around the problem of like needing some kind of intermediaries just for the control of communication. Like one person just cannot do that. And anyone who's ever been like involved in a mega church or anything that grows, whether it's a church or a business or whatever should intimately know the thing I'm describing. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. But you still have to get people to say, well, okay, so if so, it's sort of like in steps. If you go, step one is to say that the early church was unified in its thing. And I, I like to look at what happens after the council in Jerusalem, how they come together, they make this decision about what to do with the Gentile believers, and then they send out the letter that they came up with to everybody yeah. and basically say, this is what we have said, now you follow it. They didn't say... Well, this is what we think. You guys do what you want. You know, we don't have any authority over you. You guys, everyone just kind of do whatever seems right. I mean, this is what the Holy Spirit led us to. It seemed <laughs> right. good to the Holy Spirit and to us, but it may seem different to you. So you do you, we do us. They didn't do that. They said, no. this is, and, this and is what think, we have decided. I think it's uh, <laughs> incoherent to imagine they could have. Meaning, like, yeah. the idea that it, the Holy Spirit would lead two people to opposite conclusions Oh, but that's it, the world we live in right now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, but that's such a mockery of God. I agree. Say a God who's not, you know, yes and yes. He's just yes and no, and he's all over the place, and he's incoherent. Is is so much the antithesis of the God of the Bible. Um, so, but yeah, yeah okay. I, I think go the ahead. Council of Jerusalem thing's really good, because there's even more than that. If you go back and look at the context, beginning of Acts 15, we're told that the Judaizers, like the people teaching the heretical stuff, had gone out without authorization. Now, mm -hmm. Protestants reading that, should be saying, wait a second, what's going on here? You can't just like pick up a Bible and go preach if you think you've got uh, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And it's like, no, you can't. That's not how it works. St. Paul's going to say in Romans 10, how can they preach unless they are sent? It's unthinkable to him that you would just go out and preach without the sending of the church or the sending directly by Jesus that, that you know, someone like him and, and the other apostles get it. Uh, given all that, it's not surprising that the Council of Jerusalem, one of the things they they say specifically is that these went out from us without permission, that they they rebuke them, not just for teaching false things, 
but also for teaching without the permission of the church. So you have a church that's able to say things like, you know, Acts 15, 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us and impose that on all the churches around the world, like small C churches. And it also is able to rebuke teachers going out without that kind of authorization. That is something that I just don't see enough Protestants grappling with to say, well, could you do that in modern Protestantism? Is there an organization, is there a body that has that kind of authority? And then the answer is obviously no. Uh, there's what was the world evangelical Alliance going to do that? You know, the Christian council of churches, the local Methodist Senate, like, like no one has the kind of authority in Protestantism that the magisterium in Acts 15 has uh, in biblical Christianity. And that should be a big red flag that you're not actually following the structure of the church. I, I agree with that a hundred percent. And I think to me, it makes a lot of sense, you know? Um, okay. So let's say we've established the fact that the early church was unified and there was the authority of the apostles, right? Well, what do you say to someone who goes, well, yeah, but they were, they were the apostles and, you know, what happened was over time, the apostles began to die out and the church spread just like Jesus said it would. And then people began to uh, do, you know, what the Lord led them to do under all this persecution. But then, of course, you know, when Constantine came along and and then, you know, made Christianity the official religion and made, you know, created Catholicism, uh, you know, then now, now we know the Catholic Church is. But before that, like, there's this fantasy land idea of the early church that some people seem to think they can recapture, but uh, it's, of course it can't be Catholicism. So how do you, and you know, especially with this book, how do you show people that that early church specifically was the Catholic church? Yeah. So uh, let me get And of course, hold two, on, before I say that, I know that, there, Constant, I know that Constantine didn't make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. I'm just saying that's that's what people always say, but of course that didn't happen. No, oh, that was that. like only one of many things wrong with that kind of vision well, of history. It's the so narrative I hear a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, of, of course. I think there's a couple things. One is I think before you jump into explaining, it's good to ask a few questions. And so in the kind of setup that you gave, there's a little bit of a, a theory but I want to really flesh it out like in conversation with a Protestant and say like, okay, so we agree that before X day or time or whatever, there's something like Orthodox Christianity. That is like the Christianity top of the apostles still exists until when, or still exists publicly in a way that we can find it until when, because sometimes you'll have Protestants who have these you know, crazy theories about like, oh, well they all went underground and they just didn't like go out and preach like they were supposed to. And it's like, yeah, where's the evidence of that? But really put the ball in their court. If they're going to say, oh, yeah, like these Catholic teachings are later. I like to say things like, well, OK, who was the first pope? And in my experience, I've asked this question numerous times. I've never had a Protestant come back with a name. I've, ne I've always heard like either I don't know or I guess it probably depends what we mean by pope. Or like, well, the papacy, whatever it was, looked different in the early days than it does now. And it, all of these ways that just like don't address the question. Like, okay, well, who is the actual first pope? And the reason I do that, I, that's just one example. If you want to say like, who's the first one to teach like baptismal regeneration? Or when does the church start worshiping on Sunday? Or fill in the blank. Like, where do we see the heresy creep in? If you're going to say heresy creeps in, where's the first creep? Uh, where's the first, you know, like... Show me where that happens. So I at least know like what's the period of time that we mm -hmm. both agree that this is Orthodox Christianity. Is it zero to 300? Is it zero to 200? Like when do you think the true believers kind of die out or their beliefs get so messed up they're no longer true believers? Because that like when, in other words, when do the gates of hell overtake the church? Like pin down that point before you can really go any further because in the book, like I look at the first 200 years, I'm looking at zero to 200 and I, I give reasons for why I think you can make a strong argument that Christianity is still reliable by 200 and why, if you don't think that you're not left with Protestantism, you're left with like not Christianity. Like if you don't think we can trust say, say Irenaeus in 180 because you think he's a heretic, 
Well, he's the first one to tell us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the gospels that belong in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say wow. no to that, like I, I can't trust Irenaeus. Okay. Bad news. This is before the word Trinity is used to describe the Trinity. This is before the four gospels, you know, like this is when the four gospels are named all this stuff. Like if you're going to cut off the, the branch there, you don't have a lot of tree. Like there's just not, you can't say, oh, well, we'll still go with the new Testament. How are you going to go with the new Testament? How do you know you got the right books in the new Testament? Because the compilation of the new Testament is happening a lot later. So, you know, all of that stuff I would point to as a kind of just setting the framework of let's, you know, see which fathers we could even agree to care about. Because if, you know, if, if I go in and say like St. Augustine says this, a reformed Protestant might be like, oh, that's really interesting. An evangelical might say like, oh, that's, that's way too late. Like by the time you get Augustine, Constantine's already happened and Etc. So that's the first thing. I, I know there's a lot more to say, but I wanted to kind of sure. make sure that framework is super clear up front. I think that's I think that's huge because if you can if you can find that touch point where everyone can say what first of all you have to define the early church, right? right. You have to say okay, so it's like the sixth century still the early church. I had a guy tell me yeah. that the early church stops with the death of the last apostle, and I was like, wow, so what do you call 100 AD? Like medieval? Contemporary Christian, yeah. like what, what is that if it's not the early church? And Which, that's that's obviously a ridiculous view. But if if the other person is holding that, then you say, okay, then maybe we have to find another term because you apparently don't think that Christianity is reliable after John dies. And then you get into like the theology of that. Like the apostles didn't manage to convert anybody. That's just a bust, right? Like that's just a, a failure of Christianity. If, yeah, if when, you, it when you think about where their denomination came from, which is probably a couple of hundred years old, okay, so their denomination right. does a better job of passing on the truth to this guy today than Jesus did and the apostles did with the guys for the first 200 years. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> well, that's yeah, kind of compelling. Even stranger, you've got people who were born before Good Friday who are still alive after the time John died. Now, they're very old. They're in you know, their 80s yeah. or whatever. But you, those people would still, <laughs> they'd have to say like, what happened to them? Did they like believe? And then suddenly like, oh, well, I guess I can't believe anymore. The apostles are gone. It's such a baffling kind of vision of history, but it's worth really, again, like it's worth pinning down because otherwise it's really hard to move forward. Because I can show like, look, everybody believes in baptismal regeneration, but the first and biggest point is to really make sure the person I'm speaking to gets why that matters, like gets why they should care about that instead of just saying like, oh, well, I guess the expiration date was even earlier than I thought it was. Yeah, I, I, you know, I remember talking to people who would say things like, well, the early church was this pure thing. But then, and you talk about this in your book, the creeping heresy, yeah. they would say, but over time, mm -hmm. all of these kind of like barnacles on a ship, you know, they would attach themselves to the church and the farther away you get from the apostles, the more of this garbage starts to attach to the church until Luther comes along and just basically wipes, cleans everything off. You know, that's, again, that, that narrative. But I think what you do in your book is you talk about how really that's an illogical way to look at things because the whole idea of creeping, of heresy creeping in, if, you, if it's going to creep in by the first 200 years, that's a problem. Yeah, so I think there's there's a couple traits to kind of keep in mind with the church. And the first is that it's really theologically conservative. And what I mean by that is that the apostles give really clear instruction about holding on to the old teachings and rejecting any new teachings. So you've got like the epistle of Jude in verse 3 saying to contend once for all for the faith delivered to the apostles. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, St. Paul warning about like the wolves coming. And so it's like... Here, I want to point out like where there is a little bit of common ground. The like, Protestants will sometimes point to those verses and say, look, we've got these warnings that heretics are going to come. And, and as a Catholic, we say, oh, yeah, definitely. Like there have been an, a ton of heresies in the history of Christianity, uh, but they've never won out. And one of the reasons they didn't win out is precisely because the apostles left warnings to watch out for any new teaching. So like St. Jerome makes a point that if I can trace where your church came from and the founder isn't Jesus Christ, you're the ones we were warned about by St. Paul. And that's a really strong kind of a warning. But it's like, if I can trace Lutheranism back to, I don't know, Martin Luther or Calvinism back to John Calvin, that's enough to disprove them, given the theological conservatism of the church. The way they watched out for heresies was that they required that you could prove the thing you were teaching – 
is what you had been taught and the thing your teacher had been taught back to the apostles. And now when we say back to the apostles, it's not a very long road in this like pre-200 kind of era. I mentioned Irenaeus a minute ago. Irenaeus, who writes against heresies in 180, this is one of the most important, maybe the most important uh, work outside the Bible in the first 200 years of Christianity. And Irenaeus is taught uh, by St. Polycarp of Smyrna, the first bishop of Smyrna, or one of the first bishops of Smyrna, um, who was in turn a student of the Apostle John. Polycarp, we know his birth and death date really reliably because uh, when he was on trial, and was martyred in 155, he mentions that he's served Christ for 86 years. Now there's two ways of interpreting that. One is that he like converted at a young age and he's like, I don't know, maybe early nineties. The other way is that he just means like he served Christ his entire life and, and that, you know, maybe he was baptized as an infant or whatever. Uh, and so 86, but even taking the more conservative of those two, that means he was born in the year 69. He was 31 when John, his teacher died. And then he lives on another 55 years. So if you're going to say heresy didn't just like get introduced, but actually overtook Orthodox Christianity, apostolic Christianity, if you want to call it that, you're either saying that the gates of hell overcame the church during the life of John, of Polycarp, or of Irenaeus. And it's really hard to defend any of those positions if you know anything about those three guys or about their contemporaries. If you know anything about like the other brilliant theologians who were alive at the time and, and the people who were willing to be martyred for the faith and, and so on, or just all of the ways that they're fighting against false teaching. So Irenaeus, his famous work, as I said, is against heresies, meaning it's not that Christianity is so pure that no one's thought of a false idea. Christianity is fighting for its purity against heresy and it's fighting and winning. And so the, the last point I'd make here is it's really remarkable that Protestants almost universally think that the church got these really complicated, often nuanced things, right? The natures of Christ and like complex issues of Christology, Trinitarian theology that could easily be read different ways in the new Testament. Uh, all of these things, any kind of uh, reasonably Orthodox Protestant is going to say the church got all of these things right for centuries in the face of a lot of really complicated heresies that somehow the church was always able to, to win out with orthodoxy, which leads to uh, one of a few conclusions. One is the church is led by the Holy spirit. Okay, great. And I can trust the church. Another is, well, they're just so brilliant. Maybe they're individually led by the Holy spirit. Maybe you have some idea. They're just like so smart. They can figure it out. Or, or the third is like, they just got lucky, <laughs> you know, that they actually were heretics, but heretics who happened to get, Trinitarian theology sorted. And I would just say, show me the example of that anywhere in history. Like, show me the person who's just a straight up and down heretic who's able to, on their own, reason into a totally correct Christology and a totally correct Trinitarian theology. And such a person, I would venture, does not exist. Like, no one just picking up a Bible is like, oh, I get the hypostatic union. I get the way the, the two wills and two natures of Christ work in his one substance. I get the way, you know, there's one divine substance with three persons in the Trinity. No one has ever done that unaided. Uh, so given all of that, like the Protestant who says heresy is creeping into the church, again, has to say, well, A, how did it take over those guys? And B, how are those guys still so obviously led by the Spirit? Uh, to get these much more nuanced issues of theology right, if you're saying they got more basic issues of theology, like what does baptism do, wrong. Well, and then of course it it begs the question: How do we know what heresy even is? True. You and know, so, when people, when yeah, people I make think that that's, statement, a, that's a really good point. Like, yeah, when they, I mean, against heresies is not called. Um, you <laughs> against know, my opinion, yeah, my version of Christianity yeah, yeah. and somebody else's version of Christianity. It's saying that in itself is saying that there is one truth of the Christian faith, the deposit of faith passed down to the saints, and then there are departures of that that are wrong. And what I'm doing, Irenaeus says, what I'm doing is I'm going to talk about why those things are wrong and why I have the truth. But that, that statement, everybody wants to believe that they have the truth, but it's funny, like, when you press some of these guys— about their own internal contradictions or their own internal disagreements, they all want to. They all want to go to the place where they say, "Well, 
those things aren't essential. Yeah. They're, those are opinions that, you know, it's okay. A, a true believer can think this about that and someone else can can think the opposite and still be within within the the Christian the Christian framework. But you know, and I, I always was puzzled by that because these are the same people that are always out there advocating for absolute truth and the the perspicuity of perspicuity of scripture. You know, it's easy to understand. Did I say that word right? Yeah. And <laughs> and uh, making sure that everyone knows that like the Catholic position is wrong. Like wh- why? Are why is it okay to have fifteen different versions of what baptism does, except for you know the Catholic version? And so I guess for me, so what I what I hear you saying ultimately, and I've you know I've read your book, is that one of the ways that you can tell that the early church was Catholic is by looking at the theology of the yeah, Catholic yeah. Church now and saying, okay, the theology of the Catholic Church with regard to the Eucharist, with regard to baptism, and I think those are the two that you really spent a lot of time on. Mm-hmm. Um, that is most consistent with with Catholic theology. Mm-hmm. So therefore, that's a pretty good indicator. And then, of course, you move into then the structural things, the authoritative mm-hmm. things, like the bishop and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, because I think you could, you would find some some non Catholics who might say things like, "Well, I can buy into baptismal regeneration and and all of that." I mean, there are some Protestants that believe that. Not too many that would think about the Eucharist in the same way that the Catholic Church does, but there are, I've talked to some Protestants who are like, yeah, it's cool if you want to believe that's really the body of Christ, you know, we can fit that into our theology. Yeah. But talk to us, talk to us about this whole idea of the bishops and how yeah. structurally this points to Catholicism versus like any other denomination. Yeah, this is, I think, I love the way you teed up the question because I think this is where we often go awry in the sense of as Catholics, I think we fall short of proving the Catholic case because we say, look, these people in the early church believe the same thing we believe today. And a lot of Protestants are like, okay, well, so what? Like they, you know, they believe some things we believe and that doesn't make them Methodist or doesn't make them fill in the blank. And I think that's, that's a fair rejoinder that there are some things they believe that no Protestant believes, which makes it very clear that they're not Protestants uh, in, in any sense that we would use that term today. But it's less clear just from that that they are Catholic because you can imagine someone believing that thing and still not being Catholic. And so I look like with baptism, I'm looking very much at like, what is the theology like with the Eucharist? I'm actually looking more at like, what's the worship like? If you had a time machine, could you worship with the early Christians? And if you're a Protestant, the answer is very clearly no. Uh, You would you would be violating their beliefs and your denomination's beliefs to to worship with them as if you're you're doing the same thing. Uh, and I get into a lot of the stuff about like the sacrifice of the mass, which mm-hmm. Luther points to as like the most widely held belief in Christianity. And Calvin talks about like everybody before him being duped into believing this by Satan. You know, like yeah. it, you've got this, like, this is something that united laity and theologians. And uh, this is something that united the ancient church and the medieval church. Like everybody understood that the mass is the holy sacrifice that it is the same sacrifice that Last Supper is, which is the same sacrifice that Calvary is. Uh, And that understanding is totally rejected by the reformers and very explicitly. So we're looking at theology, but then we're looking at like worship. You know, do you believe what they believe? Do you worship what they worship as they worship, I should say? And then third is like the structural thing. Is it the same organization? Is it the same society? Because I could say like, oh, well, you know, this country over here believes in fill in the blank. And so does this country over there, but that doesn't make them the same country. Likewise, you can find two churches that both believe the same thing. It doesn't make them the same church. Well, okay. But if you find out like, oh no, there's actually been one continual chain of leadership. And then you'd say, okay, actually that seems to just be the same church. You know, like, oh, the same pastor is over both churches and his grandfather started both churches or whatever. Uh, So too with apostolic succession, the reason that matters is that it shows that this is no, this is literally the same church. Whether you think it still believes the same thing it believed before, it's the same actual organization. It's the same institution. It's the same society. It's the same body. And it's very explicit about that. You've got people like Ignatius of Antioch talking about how you don't have a church without bishop, presbyter, and we'd now say priest, and deacon. And then you've got people like Irenaeus, who I mentioned before, who talk about like the need for apostolic succession, that, that every church founded by the apostles 
can trace its lineage bishop by bishop to the apostles. And that is really remarkable kind of evidence. Like that's a really remarkable kind of claim because he's saying we don't just believe the same thing that like the church of Rome believed in, you know, 60, the church of Rome in 180 is literally the same church as the church of Rome in 60. And we can show that we can show who passes the torch to whom and, and so on. That's, why this structural thing matters. It isn't just how should we organize our churches? That's an important question. That's not the point. The point is the organizational thing points to this being literally the same society grown up, which is a point that uh, a lot of Protestants assume the opposite because they've just never looked at the evidence closely. And then the very last thing is in terms of holy books, you know, what were the gospels used? And here I think it's important because Protestants who will reject the early church's views of baptism, their style of worship, their uh, structure and their organization will then say, well, we can know we got the gospels right because we can trust the early church with no sense of like irony or self-awareness of like, well, you've just totally undermined, you know, any belief in the early church by rejecting them all over the place. But so that's, that's kind of the 20,000 foot argument I make in the book. I think it's great. I think it's, you know, it, it it's just, it's just clear logic when you look at it and you start to ask those questions. I mean, those questions, those foundational questions you talked about in the beginning, you know, of what is the early church and when did Orthodox Christianity, quote unquote, whatever people think the real deal Christianity, when everyone agreed, mm -hmm. when, when did that stop? And I love how you always get specific with people. Okay, well, who said that? Yeah. When did this guy claim that? Where do you, because people just have their narrative and they just throw these things out there as though they're true, but they have no way of saying, you know, well, this is, no, this is the first guy who really started getting everything wrong about the Bishop of Rome. And this is the first guy who taught this, this other stuff, you know, nobody can do that, Joe. They just, <laughs> yeah, you see this stuff really widely. You know, I still see people who say the Catholic church added seven books of the Bible in response to the reformation. Yeah. And it's like, no. Like go back and read like the third council of Carthage in the three hundreds or read what St. Augustine says about the canon or read like what books were in the Latin Vulgate. That was the predominant Bible used by ordinary Christians in the West for a thousand years plus. Like look at all of that. Look at the, what the council of Florence declares in an ecumenical council before the reformation between yeah. Catholics, Orthodox cops, that kind of thing where you just have these like popular false myths that, that just circulate. And ordinary Christians, understandably, right? Like the people who are proclaiming Jesus Christ to them are unfortunately also peddling some historical myths that are just totally fallacious. And ordinary people don't know which ones are which. And so it's helpful to just say like, okay, hold the phone. What actual evidence do you have for this thing that you believe? Because oftentimes if the person is like a, a person who's not afraid to admit they're wrong, if they're a person of goodwill, they'll either say like, actually, I don't really know. I've just always been taught that which mm -hmm. is already like, okay, that's a big thing to realize. Or they might even go look and then realize it was just totally not historically supported. Or the, the best they'll pull out is like, well, here's a person just making that claim. Uh, sometimes you'll find, here's a person making that claim and here's who they're claiming they're getting it from. And then you can kind of dig in and say, okay, cool. Does you know so-and-so really teach that false thing? And it, it really is remarkable how much of this kind of fictional stuff goes around, you know, uh, Christians didn't believe Jesus was the son of God until Constantine, you know, the Da Vinci code peddles this. And it's just like, literally read a Christian before Constantine. And <laughs> you could not, you couldn't come away believing that that's true. Like you, you can't come away reading the gospel of John and saying, Oh yeah, there's no sense of him being the son of God. It's, it's right. It's all over there. You know, there's all of this stuff that just gets, uh, repeated ad nauseum, both again, both from like Protestants and from like secular non-Christians, sure. uh, that a little bit of historical digging is, is going to debunk the sort of claim. That's if you want the negative case, that's just like, oh, you can't actually defend your view. That then opens up the door to make the positive case. But I think it's important to do both. They both say like, this thing you were taught has no basis in reality. And here's some really good evidence that the opposite is true. Awesome. I want to, I want to ask you one more question about this, Joe, and it's kind of a pivot. Um, 
How can how can this understanding that the early church was the Catholic Church help Catholics today grow in their faith? Yeah, I I think it was a uh, Hilaire Belloc who said, um, "I'm bound as a Catholic to believe in the indefectibility of the Church or whatever uh, as an article of faith." But if I were not, I suppose I would believe in it anyway, just because no institution run with such knavish imbecility could last a fortnight. And I think it's a very funny kind of line that, that captures a really profound theological truth, which is there's corruption and scandal in the church today. There was also corruption and scandal in the church in the first century. Everyone from like Judas Iscariot to like the couple in Acts that doesn't give the, the full remittance of uh, selling their house to you've got people who end up renouncing Christ uh, when it gets inconvenient, you know, under persecution and, and so on. There's early scandals as well. Uh, you find what appears to be just massive incompetence at times from the hierarchy, from the institutional church. And yet, despite it all, this is a vehicle through which God has brought people to salvation. This is a vehicle through which he has preserved orthodox teaching of the faith. Uh, and that even a Protestant should be able to acknowledge that, at least generally, uh, if they're saying, okay, well, how did anyone before the Reformation come to know who Jesus Christ was? How is it that the reformers have even heard of Jesus Christ and care what he, you know, uh, taught and said and who he was? They're not suddenly like, oh, I didn't realize Jesus was God. On the really big essential issues, even the reformers are, are at a place where they've come to a saving faith, if they're at one, because they got it from the Catholic Church. So both Protestants and, and Catholics and Orthodox and everyone should have some basic respect for the institution of the church. Uh, in the face of what are often really horrifying scandals, nevertheless endures. That is uh, really grounds for realistic optimism. Not an optimism mm. that says no okay. bad thing is going to happen, but an optimism that says even if the worst happens, God is still in control and will somehow get us through even what looks like what can't be gotten through. Because the church has, in, in G.K. Chesterton's words, you know, six times gone down to the dogs, and and yet each time it was the dogs who died and not the church. You look at these the history of the church with like this hot controversies like Arianism and these other very popular heresies and say, oh, how is the church going to get through this? And always does. So when things seem chaotic and disorganized and everything else, uh, that's not the death knell of the church. And that's just helpful kind of perspective to keep as a Catholic, not to have a sort of like Pollyannish triumphalism, but a realistic sense that like, no, no, Christ has won the victory. And as long as you stay with the church, we're going to be fine. And uh, that doesn't mean there aren't controversies, problems, scandals, and, and the like. But it does mean that the, the bark of Peter won't be sunk. It's the oldest, like the papacy is the oldest government in human history. It's the longest lasting institution. And so even from like a secular perspective, that should raise some alarm bells and say, like, how in the world is that possible? This small, basically defenseless uh, body and some prime real estate in Rome hmm. has somehow preserved uh, some, some institutional integrity for 2000 years. That's pretty remarkable. So all you got to say, given all of that, it gives me solid grounds for hope. The second thing is the, the church fathers have a lot they can teach us. Uh, if if you want a good Lenten kind of practice for these last few days of Lent, uh, go and read the Church Fathers. You might pull up the Office of Readings if you have the Liturgy of the Hours, or if you want to look online for the Litur Liturgy of the Hours today, Office of Readings today. And there's basically every day uh, some sermon by one of the early Christians, and they're moving and they're powerful and they're beautiful. You know, for instance, like the whole theology of why it is that uh, the early Christians talk about Mary as the new Eve when you really dig into that, it's just mind-blowing. It's, it's really beautiful stuff. So I'd say it's not just like, oh, well, we're going to get through it even in the face of scandals. Also, like, these are our fathers in the faith, and they've got a lot they can teach us if we'll just take the trouble to actually sit and listen to them. Wow, that's that's an incredible answer. I think, I think that's huge. You know, as a convert to the church, just the idea of being connected in a real way, that these were real people, and that... I'm a part of what they were a part of. Yeah. That's just that's just powerful encouragement, Joe. Thank you so much for sharing this and for writing this book. I really I really appreciate it. This has been this has been uh, 
just incredible. Where can people find out about this? Where can they get their hands on it? And uh, what else can you tell us about what you're up to with Catholic Answers too? Make sure you give us an opportunity oh, yeah. to follow you there. So I'd be happy to. Um, there are a lot of places you can get the book. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at your local Catholic bookstore. I'd recommend shop.catholic.com. I think you'll get the best rate there. You can also, if you're so interested, you can do bulk buys. You know, like I think they've got like 20 copies of the books for $60, which is like $3 a book. So if this is something you want to give out as like an Easter gift, or if you want to like bug all of your uh, non-Catholic friends with it, or if you want to give, you know, whatever, like go do like a Bible study or book study, you know, any of those things, like go nuts. So you can probably get the best rate at shop.catholic.com. In terms of stuff I'm working on right now, I'm uh, launching a new podcast, uh, which I'm excited about. Uh, Keith, I think you were on my old podcast. I'm, I'm looking forward to starting a new one very soon. Yes. That'll have a video component. So watch for that. It, it's tentatively called Shameless Popery, which is the name of my blog. Um, and yeah, I'm working on a bunch of other stuff. I'm going to be on Capturing Christianity. I don't know what day this is going to air, but that'll have either just happened or will be about to happen. But maybe look up Capturing Christianity and see yeah. if... Uh, the interview on the papacy is out as well. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff like that going on, but that's everything I can think of right now worth uh, making sure I, I share. Well, we're super proud of you here, Joe, and uh, I'm just thankful for you and for your ministry and for how you break things down in ways that are easy to understand and powerful at the same time. That's that's tough to do. You know, it's either things are really powerful, but they're hard to understand, or they're easy to understand, but they're, you know, chicken soup for the soul or whatever. And, <laughs> and you, you found a way to kind of bring those two things together in a way that relates to me and helps me to understand things. So I want to thank you for that, Joe. And thank you so much for being here on Catholic Feedback. I really appreciate it, my friend. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it a lot, Keith. Absolutely. All right, my friends, make sure you check out Joe's book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. I'll put a link to that in the description. Is also I also will to Catholic Answers, where Joe is now working. I want to thank all of you for joining me here on this episode of Catholic Feedback, and I pray that your understanding of the early church is going to help you grow, not just in your assuredness that the Catholic Church is the church founded by Christ, but that it's going to help you grow in your holiness, because that's really the point, my friends. God bless all of you, and we'll see you back here next time on Catholic Feedback. Thanks for listening to Catholic Feedback with Keith Nestor. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Stewardship, a mission of faith, and is also supported by our team at patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor. Please consider joining our support team. Catholic Feedback is a production of Down to Earth Ministries. For more information about Down to Earth or to bring me to your parish or event, visit down the number two earthministry.org. See you next time.